Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first ACR Grand Round. Today's presentation is the ACR Winning the War Against Breast Cancer with Dr. Mike Lindbergh. For those in discovery, please mute your cell phones. Before we get started, for those on the webinar and in our overflow rooms, I have just a couple of quick items. When you joined today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you need to change those selections, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. You have the opportunity to ask questions. Please type them into the questions pane and we will read them for you at the end of the presentation. For those in this room, we'll have a microphone at the back for you to ask questions. And I'll now turn it over to Dr. Forrest for a few words about Grand Brown. Thanks very much, Megan. It really is a pleasure. For those of you that have not been in an academic, a medical academic institution, Grand Rounds is the joining and the merging of multi-specialties uh, where everybody comes together on a topic of great interest. And it's held usually on a week weekly basis. Uh, it really is a unifying feature uh, within those academic centers. And so when Jenny uh, came up, and Jenny Jones is the originator of the idea of ACR Grand Rounds, it happened to coincide at the time that we were doing the Culture of Excellence survey last March, and it very much merged with what we heard from all of you of, I'd really like to know what's going on beyond the bounds of, of the, the group that I work with. So this really was a, a perfect match, as I say, of this solution uh, to those requests. So I'm not going to take up like this, just this minute to point out and thank Jenny and her entire team. I won't go through the whole list, but she put together really a terrific team that's been meeting on a regular basis, working since the spring. And when we just, were trying to decide how to best kick this off, there was no uh, better opportunity, I think, as far as what the college has done uh, over time uh, than the, the impact on breast cancer detection and the improvement in women's health. So there was, and there was no greater speaker uh, to do that than Mike Lindbergh. So I'll turn it over to Jenny to do the formal introduction, but we really do hope that you'll continue to participate with us in the ACR Grand Rounds. We anticipate this being about eight times a year. We'll publish the uh, topics, and we want to hear from you about topics you'd like to hear as well. So again, my congratulations to Jenny, her entire team, and Jenny, take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thorworth, and thank you all for coming to this first Grand Rounds. We're so excited to have you here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Lindbergh. Dr. Lindbergh is a clinical professor of radiology at the University of New Mexico and director emeritus of the Breast Imaging Center of X-ray Associates of New Mexico in Albuquerque. He has been a breast imaging specialist for the past 30 years. He he often delivers lectures as part of his work um, and delivers uh, lectures extensively about mammography. He has presented more than 1,300 lectures in 37 states across the country and in more than 24 other countries. He has a little bit of experience at this. Uh, he is the author of more than 60 published articles and textbook chapters on mammography and is a strong political proponent of quality mammography. He helped to shape the final rules of the Mammography Quality Standards Act and the BIRAD Atlas. He is also one of the creators of the ACR Breast Imaging Boot Camp, which has now trained more than 2,000 radiologists from around the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mike Lindbergh. and I want to thank Dr. Starworth and everybody here at the ACR for all the wonderful work you do and for the opportunity to talk to you today about what has so been my passion for the last 30 years, and that is trying to win the war against breast cancer. And certainly, this is a war that is ongoing, uh, as you may know. Uh, it, you can't go by a day without seeing something about uh, this war uh, in, in the media. Uh, certainly, this uh, medical journal that you're all familiar with, Time Magazine, <laughs> has featured uh, this issue back in 2003, uh, with, uh, talking about the new thinking. And then this brilliant headline in 2015, what do I, if I decide to just do nothing, oh, that's brilliant. But to once, <laughs> once in a while, they do get it right. Uh, this issue did get it right back in 2007 when they talked about why breast cancer is spreading around the world. It has truly become a pandemic, uh, not unique to this country. Although here in the United States and Canada, we lead the world in the incidence of breast cancer, but this is seeing uh, this kind of situation is being seen all around. 
around the world. Just to show you, for example, in the country of Denmark, breast cancer incidence has gone up 50% over the last 30 years. In Slovakia, it's gone up 75%. In Finland, where they've even done a, some a screening, it's still going up to the rate of 100% increase over the last 30 years. And in Singapore, uh, as in many of the countries in Southeast Asia, we thought, well, these women are somehow protected by their genetics or the fish and rice diet. But and even there, the, the death rate, the, the incidence of breast cancer has continued to climb. It's up 200% over the last 30 years. So there's something going on worldwide, a true pandemic in uh, incidence of breast cancer. But in the face of that, at least in countries that have organized or or partially organized screening of for breast cancer with mammography, it's a different story. The death rate, even in the face of this increasing incidence of breast cancer, the death rate from breast cancer has continued to fall. Here in the United States, this is a chart showing various uh, cancers and the death rates over time, beginning 75 years ago. Uh, and you can see that the pink line here for breast cancer was absolutely code stable for 60 years. Nothing changed, nothing changed. Despite surgery, despite drugs, despite uh, radiation, it didn't make any difference. Breast cancer death rates did not change until 1990. What happened in 1990? About five years before that, screening started in earnest with mammography here in the United States. And ever since then, it has plummeted. The death rate has fallen as of 2007 and 18. This year, it's gone down 43%. Almost half of the deaths that were occurring in 1990 are not occurring now. Unbelievable. And there's no question why that's happening. Here in the United States, uh, as I mentioned, it still is a very common disease. One woman in eight will get breast cancer by the age of 95, which should always live so long. But 20% of breast cancers occur under the age of 50. This is still a young woman's disease as well. And only a small proportion of those are due to heredity, maybe 5 to 10%. The others are just spontaneous mutations or other things we don't know about yet. Um, and as I mentioned, incidence continues to climb, but even in the face of that, the death rate is falling when screening is taking place with mammography. No question, mammography is the number one reason this has occurred. Over 50% of uh, women in the United States were getting screened yearly. Uh, and there's no question treatment is better than it's ever been, but it's not the reason the death rate is falling. If we don't deliver the cancer at a time that it's small enough to be cured, it doesn't matter what they throw at the disease, it's not going to be curable. So, we are truly making a difference with screening. And the evidence is overwhelming. Randomized controlled trials, which are the most uh, accurate way to measure the effect of a, a particular intervention, has, uh, there have been 10 different trials. All of them have shown a benefit, uh, a huge benefit the, to the women who actually get screened, uh, as have the observational trials all throughout the world, the so-called organized screening programs. And then we have surrogate data. If you look at, at the uh, size of tumors, we use that as the surrogate endpoint. If the tumors are found when they're small, women are cured. If the tumors are found when they're big, when they don't get screened, then the tumor patients don't do as well. And the modeling has shown the same thing. All of these have shown at least a 30% decrease in breast cancer deaths in the women who get screened versus the women who do not. So there's no question it's making a huge difference. How often does, uh, should women be screened? Well, there's a lot of debate. There are six different organizations in the United States who, uh, who issue guidelines for screening, all completely different in terms of the age it starts, uh, the age to stop mammography, the interval that it should be done, and even whether or not tomosynthesis ought to be used. Every single one uh, it offers slightly different guidelines, which is indeed confusing. And some women kind of throw up their hands and say, well, if the experts can't decide, why should, why should I even do anything? But the good news is, most women still get mammograms, and the really good news is they tend to follow the guidelines of the American College of Radiology and Society of Breast Imaging, which are getting screened every year beginning at age 40. This is what produces the optimal results in curing this disease. And truly, we can cure it now if we do find it early. And the, the, the history is phenomenal, and I want to go through with you a brief history of what has happened with mammography over the last 50 years. Quite a story. Now, early on, not so successful. Uh, uh, but, but very quickly, beginning in the 60s, uh, things changed dramatically with the advent of the first true mammography uh, uh, exams. They were done initially on a general x-ray tube, 
which was adapted uh, by using a, what they call low KB exposure, which allows us to see soft tissue detail, which we normally cannot see when we're using a higher KB to penetrate. So, but this is unique because of the nature of the breast tissue. With low KB technique, you could see the soft tissue, but they didn't even use any compression, which defeated a lot of the purpose of, of, of the ability of, of us to see in, within the breast tissue. This is the way it was done initially. Uh, pretty basic, but not really a great picture. Uh, positioning was very primitive. People didn't really understand the best way to get positioning initially, and the technique was generally bad uh, because the technology was limited at that point. Uh, and the images, even worse. Um, I don't know how we found anything truly back in the 60s. <laughs> Here they are. The images, quite black, uh, not much contrast. Uh, they didn't know how to, how to uh, mask. They had the lights on. They were using these uh, handheld uh, magnifying glasses that are very primitive, but even so, we made a huge difference in our ability to find early breast cancer. But then in the mid-60s, along came a truly dedicated mammography machine, which allowed uh, us to see even more. Now, they still didn't understand how good compression should be, and unfortunately for women, we do have to compress the breast, but it does make a huge difference in the ability to see all the tissue. Uh, and they couldn't, because of the, of the nature of the exposure, there was always underexposure near the chest wall, so you couldn't see the tissue all the way back along the chest wall. Uh, and the exposures, even then, were qu quite long, five to six seconds. That's, that's, the radiation dose was much higher than it is today. Now it's, it's down to a, a very minuscule dose, as you know. This was one of the first machines uh, produced in France, in CGR, a uh, Centigrad back in 1966, a big step forward. Uh, from the modern images, again, not so great, but a big step forward from what we had initially. But then there was another breakthrough called zero radiography, which took place in the early 70s. Here they didn't use film, instead they used the charged selenium plate, and then the x-rays would discharge part of the selenium, and there would be then sprinkle on this blue toner powder, which would then uh, arrange itself depending on what had been discharged on the plate. Then they fixed that with a uh, special uh, Material and then transferred it onto paper. So these are paper images, no more film, uh, or we thought uh, for a while. And it had, had a much wider latitude, allowed us to see all the way back to the chest wall and even up to the skin, which was huge. And it also had this phenomenon of what they call edge enhancement, where anything that had any density to it showed up more brightly because the powder would align itself along those lines and, and, and allow us to see with, with better contrast things that were abnormal. This is what a zero uh, radiograph looked like. You can see the match set that to the, the side views. And you can see all the way back to the chest wall. You can even see the ribs, which you didn't need to see, because that's not where breast cancer occurred. But uh, you can see all the way up to the skin. So this was a huge step forward. The problem is the equipment was extremely cumbersome, hard to use, broke down all the time, not very practical. Uh, but the good news is, at about the same time, rapid advances were being made in film screen mammography. Compression devices where they learned so that, that when the breast is compressed, it spreads the tissue out, you can see everything much more better be, much better because this is a homogeneous image. And by the use of high speed screens, more sensitive film, and reciprocating grids, we're able to get the dose down and produce sharper images at the same time. And by using something called extended processing and the development of, of quality assurance procedures, images got even better. So it was a huge step forward. And then they learned also that if you do two views that are relatively uh, orthogonal, one from the top and one from the side, you can find it in many more things than you can on one view only. So this became the standard. Here's what a film screen mammogram looked like at that time. You can see it's pretty good. You can see all the way back to the back part of the image and all the way to the front. The skin was a little burned out, but the good news is breast cancer doesn't occur in the skin. So uh, that wasn't as critical as the other issues. And then we also added the side view as well as the top view, so-called MLO view. This became the standard at that time, and things went forward until another huge revolution occurred in 2000, with the development of the advent of digital mammography. Mammography was the last uh, bastion of radiology to enter the digital world because it was difficult to do. Uh, but they did it finally in 2000, and uh, the concept is the same thing we use in digital photography. As you know, you take a picture, and with a regular film camera, you're stuck with that image. You can't do anything to it. But with digital, because of our ability to post-process, we can enhance the image, make it better. 
as uh, I'll just show you an example from my own family. This is our 50th uh, wedding anniversary celebration we had last summer in the Turks and Caicos. We took everybody there. But the image was a little dark, you know, it was a little underexposed. So all I did was go back to our uh, computer, and with the push of a button, improve the image. Now it's great. And this is the same concept with digital mammography. Uh, with film, you start with the X-ray tube, exposes the film, the film goes to the processor, out of the processor pops the uh, film, and you're stuck with the image, good or bad. That's it. And it took about five minutes for that process to work. Hence, when the digital came along, everything changed. Now the X-ray source exposed a detector, which then had uh, various pixels, uh, which uh, uh, acquired the data, which was then fed into a computer, which then re-imaged uh, re re those or re reordered them so that they could be displayed on a monitor. Once it's on the monitor, if, the, if it didn't look quite right, you could change the contrast, change the brightness, you could uh, do all kinds of things to the image, make it darker, make it lighter, whatever it took, make the image better, and the whole process took about 20 seconds. So a huge improvement all the way around. Big advantage. Exam time was down. Big improvement there. It made the screening much more efficient and cost effective. And the display, the, the ability to post-process, the so-called window and level, and magnify it. We could see things we never could see before. Unbelievable. So this was a huge step forward, especially in dense tissue. Here's a uh, digital mammogram, a little light, a little underexposed. Push a button, no problem. And enhance the image dramatically. Uh, if you see calcifications, which is sometimes the only sign of a cancer, little white dots and a black background, some people feel that you can see them better if you reverse that image, no problem. Push the button, now we reverse the image, now it's black on white. Uh, what about a little tiny cluster of calcification? Can't see it really well, let's just magnify it. Now, uh, don't have to pull out a, a, an old magnifier, and now we can do it electronically in one second, just pop it in there, and now we uh, can see the calcification is much, much better. All done digital. Remarkable. Big advantage. And we can store the images, retrieve them more easily, no more lost films. There's only one original film. Couldn't even make a good copy of it. So this was a huge step forward to be able to uh, allow for better, more space and the fact we wouldn't lose films. And the real advantage is we could take these images and display them anywhere in the world instantly just by sending it over the uh, internet. Unbelievable. Uh, and this really has revolutionized screening. You can send them anywhere. And in fact, in some countries, they have organized uh, so-called centers of excellence. So they send all the images to an expert to read, like they do in Sweden. Uh, and in British Columbia, up in uh, Canada, they, they have a special program. And they're all read by experts. So they can do that because they can send all the images from around the country uh, into one site. So this is a huge step forward. Uh, for instance, images here in Casper, Wyoming. I had a friend up there. He would send me cases. He'd say, you know, would you take a look at this? And in about two seconds, it's on my screen. Unbelievable. And uh, just remarkable what this technology can do. The machines didn't look terribly different from the older machines. A little bit uh, larger head. And the, uh, the receptor is a little bit thicker and larger than on the older units. But I must say, they do a remarkable job. The images are gorgeous. You can see a great example. This is the CC view from the top, and here's the view from the side, so-called MLO view. See how beautifully it displays the really dense tissue in the middle, and yet you can see all the way out to the, to the skin and all the way back to the chest wall with no problem. Uh, big change, I would say. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a change since 1980. Yeah, just a bit. So a remarkable step forward. Then we came to something even more interesting, something called tomosynthesis, the so-called 3D mammogram. And back in 2010, this really came to the fore. Why? Because of this phenomenon of superimposition of, of normal tissue over cancers and the fact that uh, some cancers that look like cancer, even though they're not, uh, because of the same superimposition. The patient once gave me this. She called it a Waldogram. Where's Waldo? He's in there someplace. Can you see him? Pretty tough. If he were the only one there, it'd be easy, but he's not. And that's the problem with mammography. There he is. Still hard to see, right? We put on an electronic magnifier, now we can see it. And it's the same concept uh, when we're faced with a dense uh, mammographic tissue. So the problem is the superimposition that hides cancer and superimposition that mimics what looks like a cancer, which isn't even real. It'd be nice if we could just get to that one slice uh, where the cancer is hiding, instead of it being hidden by other things overlying it, when we look at the summation image that is the usual 2D mammogram. 
So the solution was to create a three-dimensional mammographic exam that could minimize the effects of that structure overlap. What if we could actually get to that one slice that would get the cancer seen and get all that other stuff out of the way right there? Wouldn't that be slick? And that's exactly what we can do. Get to that one slice and find the cancer that otherwise would have been seen. How does that work? Well, there's an extra tube that moves across in an arc that produces a series of low-dose images centered between 12 and 15 images at different angles as it goes across. Uh, and even though there are more images, each one is a very, very tiny dose, so the whole dose is about the same as a regular mammogram. Uh, and then these, are, these projection images are put into a black box and, and it reconstructed into one millimeter slices. So literally, you're, we're looking at thin, thin slices all the way through the breast. The arc of motion of the X-ray tube is across the breast. Here's the breast in compression, with the compression paddle in place. The X-ray tube moves across. And then it's reconstructed in these one millimeter slices all the way through from top to bottom. And then it's restacked like a loaf of bread, and we can pull out any one slice, and we actually uh, scroll through this on our monitors. We're looking at one slice of time. Well, it looks like you're moving through it. Uh, and it improves the visibility. Here we see something that doesn't look like much on this slice. Some more things that don't look like anything. They're round and smooth. They look benign. But then all of a sudden, bingo, you get to one that looks different, very different. In fact, it looks irregular, typical, very typical of what a cancer looks like. And now we can see it. It's no longer hidden by those overlying other findings. The machine, a little bit bigger than uh, the uh, digital machine, even a slightly larger receptor, uh, but uh, quite a, a, a spectacular uh, device. There are now six different companies, uh, five in the United States, that are producing this machine. Um, as you can see, the head moves across, producing these various images as it, as it passes through. So here's a case of a patient. This is a regular 2D view from the top. And uh, the tissue is pretty dense, but what we saw was there kind of a lumpy area over here. It doesn't look particularly worrisome. It looks a lot like the other tissue. There it is. We blew it up electronically. Mm, still not very impressive. But then we went through and looked at uh, the area in the tomosynthesis. <clears throat> look at that. Now, does that look worrisome to you? Let me tell you, this is very worrisome. Why? Because it has the classic features of a breast cancer, an invasive cancer. The word cancer, what does it mean in Latin? It's Latin for crab. crab. And that's exactly what you see. Know, the legs of the tumor is coming, are coming together, those straight lines all coming together. Classic appearance of the breast cancer. And you can see how much that does look like a crab. And that's why, that's why, the, that's why cancer is used to describe uh, cancer. It's, it's from the description of the initial breast cancers that we're seeing. So that's where mammography is today. But there are lots of other things going on as well. The ability to image guide our biopsies with imaging. Never before, until about 1980, were we were able to do this. In the old days, even if it was a cyst, we didn't know. So the surgeon would have to go in and remove this every single time. It, whether it was found on imaging or it came in with a lump, didn't matter. There was no way to safely biopsy these uh, any other way than just to go in surgically and take it out. In fact, women didn't know whether they were going to come out with the breast or not because they were, they were told, we don't know if it's cancer or not. If it's cancer, you'll wake up without a breath. How terrible was that? Pretty terrible. But then came stereotaxis, the ability to find breast cancer and identify it and biopsy it with image-guided uh, needles. And they can do it with either prone or upright. Here's how it works. They need two, two views that are 15 degrees apart, and then through this something called the parallax method. There we can change the density and make it prettier. Through the parallax method, we can figure out the exact depth. Not only do we know the width and the height, we can figure out the depth and advance a needle to that point, to that exact spot, sample. The needle itself was quite an innovation as well uh, because it combined the ability to penetrate and also to suck the tissue in with a vacuum to pull it into a spot where we could actually sample it successfully. This is the piercing tip of the needle. It's just an enlargement to show you. There was a vacuum line that then was, uh, was connected to a sampling notch this little uh, sampling notch where the tissue was collected, and the little tiny holes that were pulling the tissue in with the vacuum lighter so, so that the tissue would become trapped in that notch, and then there would be this hollow uh, coaxial cutter that would come across and trap that tissue in the notch. And it was just spectacular, brilliant a bit of uh, technology that allowed us for the first time to sample tissue without surgery. Unbelievable. Here you can see a little cluster of calcifications, the little white dots right at the end of the needle. This is our first image. We know we've gotten to the right spot after we found the right coordinates. Then we advance the needle through that area, and now you can see the little notch 
you see that with the calcifications right below it, and we actually go around 360 degrees and collect the tissue around the notch too. And then to make sure we've got them, then here's the, here you can see the tissue is being taken out, that little sample of tissue uh, that came out of the notch. We take a picture of it, a so-called uh, specimen radiograph, and there are the calcifications. Bingo, we got what we're going after, we were going after. We know immediately because we take a sample, a picture of the sample. Big step forward. Then came another big step, breast ultrasound. Back in the 80s, not so good. In the 90s, it started to really improve to the, to the point where we can see it well and see things well with ultrasound. Uh, ultrasound technique hasn't changed too much. The transducer, with that little area that actually allowed the sort of um, camera, if you will, that allows us to look within the breast with ultrasound, has improved dramatically, uh, has, as have as the other hardware. Uh, and we are now able to tell whether lesions are almost certainly benign or almost certainly malignant based on their appearance on ultrasound. And this is especially helpful in patients with a palpable lump. It's very common to see cysts, the number, number one reason for a palpable lump. Cysts are totally benign, they're just collections of water. And on ultrasound, you can make that distinction. Mammogram can't distinguish between something that's got water in it or solid tissue, but ultrasound can. See a big round black hole? That is all due to water. So when you see that, we know it's benign. And we don't have to do anything. It's a buying good luck. Or we can drain it if it's bothering you, but it's not cancer. And it's easy to see on ultrasound. Ultrasound is a wonderful adjunct to mammography. Uh, if it's cancer, sometimes we see cancers we can't even see on the mammogram. They're so subtle. And here's an example. This cancer here, this very vague black area in the middle. You see there's a little bit of white in it, too. Here's another very subtle one. Both turned out to be cancers. Much better seen on ultrasound than they were, than they were even on mammography. So ultrasound is a wonderful adjunctive tool in the right situation. Uh, coupled to that was the ability to biopsy also with ultrasound. And this came about also in the uh, 1990s and the development of a, a special technique where the needle was advanced under the transducer. It's all real time, so we can actually see the needle going into the edge of the lesion. And here it is being taken down, and then we cantilever the needle so it was pointing straight through it. And then we would advance it through and collect the sample just like we did on stereotaxis. Here's a picture showing the lesion, that black thing, and then the tip of the needle. We see it's right at the edge. Now we know we can safely go through it and sample it correctly. And now you can see it passing through there, collecting the tissue uh, from the uh, notch that, was, uh, that I showed you before. Then came another big breakthrough. It's called MRI. MRI's been around for a while, since the mid-'80s, but it really wasn't very effective for looking at breast tissue. People just think, ah, it's not good. But then they discovered something very interesting. If you develop a special coil, you can really see the breast tissue pretty well. Here's how it was designed so that the special coil was developed that allowed us to see just the breast and the tissue around it uh, with a large field of view. And by injecting intravenous contrast, tumors would light up because of a phenomenon known as neoangiogenesis. Tumors in general, most malignant tumors, are vastly, vastly and their vascularity is different from normal vessels. The, vas the vascularity goes in quickly, the blood goes in quickly, and goes out quickly. So as a result, it looks different from everything else we see in, on the uh, MRI. And this uh, contrast-enhanced series, we use a series of different techniques and a power injector to inject the contrast. Unfortunately, we still have to use contrast. Uh, someday we may not, but right now we still do. Here's what it looks like. This is called a MIP image. Uh, showing a sort of 3D demonstration of both breasts. And you can see something lighting up. You see that right there? And it's, it's color-coded to show that this is very intensely vascular. And not only did it, did it, was it vascular, but it was vascular in a unique way, that the blood flow went in quickly and went out quickly, the so-called uh, rapid uh, outflow or, or uh, uh, washout. And this is typical of cancer. So when we see this particular kind of pattern, this washout pattern in these lesions, we, we know that likely the malignancy is extremely high. And we can see things we couldn't see on mammography and we couldn't see on ultrasound. So it's a very valuable adjunctive tool. Because of the way these are collected, what we call isotropic voxels, we can reconstruct the breast in any plane and then produce a whole hologram out of it. Here's an example of that same case. And this is extremely helpful in identifying exactly where it is in the breast, especially for the surgeon when they're planning surgery. Very, very unique tool and, and uh, obtainable only with MRI. Here's a case just to show you how powerful MRI can be. Case, this is an older case of film screen, but you can see there's a big lump right up here, and that's what the patient presented with. 
She presented with a lump under her arm, the axilla. Uh, no definite breast mass in on mammogram. You see the mammogram looks pretty benign looking. There's nothing exciting about it. Ultrasound, same thing. So where's the cancer? Why is this, or is this a cancer? We don't know. Sometimes you have lymph nodes because of infection, other reasons that enlarge. This particular one, though, here's the, on your left, you see what the blue arrow is. That's the big fat lymph node looking kind of much fatter than the normal lymph node. And on your right, you can see the needle passing through it where we did the biopsy, that ultrasound-guided biopsy. Came back metastatic adenocarcinoma, consistent with a breast primary. So we knew somewhere on the breast, usually on that same side, there's a cancer. So we didn't see it on mammogram, didn't see an ultrasound, perfect case for MRI, boom, there it is. Fairly sizable cancer, not visible any other way until you get the MRI. So very good uh, example to show you, and there's that washout pattern again uh, with, when we looked at the blood flow. So is this going to become the ultimate breast imaging tool? Is MRI the way we're going? Well, maybe. Or will we, there be something even better? We don't know, but there's no question that uh, we await a very exciting next chapter in this story. So that's the story, but it's not really the whole story because here's the story behind the story, and that is the role of the ACR and all of these fantastic fellows. It was a huge amount of uh, involvement by the ACR, beginning back with the development of the ACR uh, practice guidelines and the appropriateness criteria. Back in the 80s and the 90s, uh, these were developed uh, in every area of radiology, including breast imaging, and they continue to be utilized as a measure of, of practice quality. They remain current because they're revisited every two to four years, so that they stay current, so everybody knows exactly the way things should be done. The appropriateness criteria also provide not only radiologists, but others, quantifiable measures for following these guidelines. Uh, so, again, very, very useful to those of us who practice and others. Before 19, 2004, they were actually called practice standards. Uh, but that was a little too medical legally wishy-washy, you know? <laughs> so they changed it to practice guidelines. It's still kind of being used uh, in, in medical legally, but that's okay because you know we have to have something to which to, uh, to aspire to. And uh, they, they're also called technical standards. But these guidelines have been very, very helpful. Here's an example, just showing the practice guideline for the performance of diagnostic mammography. Again, these are updated every two to four years. And here's an example of the appropriateness criteria. You can see every test that might be used for any particular uh, problem is rated from one to nine on its value in that particular situation in helping to resolve it. And you can see in this case, there are, uh, for a couple of the breast mass, a diagnostic mammogram, we had a rating of nine, so it means it's very good, and the same with ultrasound. So every one of these appropriate criteria are useful to us in practice and to others to show whether the right thing is being done for any particular uh, medical problem. Out of this grew the accreditation program, which is one of the real uh, stars in, in the crown of ACR. Uh, these were based, as I said, on the practice guidelines. They're even more stringent. They look at all kinds of other faculty performance issues. Uh, and it was an entirely voluntary program, uh, still is actually, um, and begun back in 1987 with mammography. The mammography accreditation program has begun far back in, back in 1987. Boy, that's almost 30 years ago. It is 30 years ago. Wow. Uh, long time. Why? Because there were no controls on the quality of the images. The images that I showed you were pretty awful. And everybody was doing things differently. Nobody, there were no rules. There were no guidelines to follow. And so this became a critical issue. And, and ACR took this by the horns and went with it and develop the uh, accreditation program. So it's very voluntary, but there were requirements for not only the uh, clinical images, but also they developed a phantom image to look at how good each machine was doing, seeing the things they should be seeing for breast cancer. Uh, this became a template uh, used by the FDA for the establishment of the mandatory rules of the MQSA, which I'll show you in a minute. But there were many uh, parts of the accreditation program. There were the personnel qualifications, everybody involved, Allergists, et cetera, um, spec equipment specifications that had to be met, and the clinical images. Really, that's where the rubber meets the road. If you don't have, if the cancer isn't on the picture, you can't find it. So you had to have good images. And that was the key. Um, there were eight different features that were all evaluated by those who were those, those of us who were clinical image reviewers. I was one. I was a clinical image clinical image reviewer for 20 years. I really enjoyed the process. It gave me a good snapshot of what was going on in the country, and I must say the improvement was dramatic that I saw over those 20 years. 
The ACR was right on top of things and helping proceed, helping improve things. They even issued this uh, wonderful article back in, in 2000 and in the year 2000 to help facilities to show them where the problems lie in the cases in the accreditation facilities that did not pass. Positioning was the number one reason they didn't pass. Here's an example just showing you these kinds of images did not pass accreditation. There was a big fold up here, and you see the tissue is cut off down here, and it's cut off over here. What if there were a cancer? It would have been missed. So the ACR did a huge role in improving the quality of images through this accreditation program. Uh, phantom image, they also developed this beautiful phantom, uh, which is still used today, uh, and it shows little masses and little things that look like calcifications so that they can, it simulates what can be seen on any machine. So every machine is, is, is uh, it takes a picture of the phantom, they send that in for accreditation. If the quality of the image is not satisfactory, it won't pass, even if the clinical images look good. If the phantom images are no good, the, the, uh, the facility doesn't pass. There were also QA and QC requirements as part of this, quite extensive, a little bit beyond the scope of the presentation, but it included the technologist QC, quality assurance, medical audit, uh, reporting, record keeping, implant uh, uh, imaging, and consumer replace, all, all part of the same process. The ACR very uh, proactive in making sure everybody was aware of this. Uh, they even had uh, on their website a whole area for frequently asked questions, so anybody who would applying for accreditation would understand what the issues were and how to, how to solve them. Uh, but you could even apply directly online. ACR made this very, very easy for uh, facilities. And because of this, a lot of facilities who were doing bad work stopped doing mammography. Those who did good work got even better. You can see over time, in 2000, there were almost 13,000 units. By 2010, it was down to about 12,400. So about 500 and so units closed or chose not to participate because they were doing inferior work, which was great, great for the public. Now there were some real standards that were being met, and the ACR was a huge, huge part of that. The process uh, is not real easy, it has, and so it's done uh, very, very stringently, beginning with the application, which the ACR reviews, and then the facility completes it. Uh, then the ACR builds and reviews the full application, then they, <coughs> the images are, are sub, uh, submitted by the facility. They send in pictures, one of a dense breast, one of a fatty breast, and those are evaluated by the clinic for image reviewers. And everything is reviewed, and either the facility is found to be deficient and uh, flunks, or they pass. And if they flunk, they've got some options. If they pass, then they are able to get a accreditation for three years. So every three years, they still have to be reaccredited, which is great. Um, and the ACR looked at the success of this program, and it was pretty dramatic. This was after the first 10 years. No question mammography has improved, and it's been due to the efforts of the ACR more than anyone else. Everybody in this room is partially responsible for this, I must tell you. Beginning between 87 and 91, 70% of the facilities passed on their first attempt. 30% flunked. But by 2003, 88% of the facilities passed on their first go-around. They really got the message of how to do this well. We didn't lower our standards, we kept raising them, and the facilities kept right on, on board with this. And it was so gratifying to see this kind of wonderful response from the radiology community. This led to the development of the next uh, big step that was the stereotactic press biopsy voluntary accreditation program begun in 1996. And again, uh, radiologists, mainly for radiologists, but if a surgeon was well trained and wanted to do this, they could pass uh, accreditation. Very few surgeons do that, though, because this is usually done in the hands of the radiologist. Lots of outcome data, lots of performance data that has to be met uh, as part of this accreditation program. And for the first time, they created some QC manuals. ACR was wonderful about this. They created a, a great QC manual for stereotaxis. They have one for each area of breast imaging now, so that there is a book people can look at to follow the rules as well as uh, other material they get online. Then came along the ultrasound guided breast biopsy program for accreditation in 1998, followed very quickly by one for all of breast ultrasound in 2000. These were kind of coupled together. They're usually done together. That is the breast ultrasound and the biopsy, uh, ultrasound biopsy accreditation program sort of rolled into one. Uh, and this was, there was less pressure to obtain this kind of accreditation uh, because mammography was certainly uh, being <coughs> more mandated. But the ultrasound was not, but even so, radiologists embraced it. 2003, only a few, but by 2010, 
uh, over 1,200 facilities had uh, gotten accredited. So everybody realized it's all about quality, and ACR provided that link to allow them to achieve that quality. Then in 2010, breast MRI was added to this uh, mix with the first accreditation program there. Uh, again, you have a continuing experience in education. The equipment had to meet certain standards, of course, and did the ability to do biopsy. It wasn't, uh, you had to at least have a facility you could send the uh, patient to to have a biopsy if you saw something on the MRI. And all of this was bundled into what was called the Centers of Excellence uh, accreditation procedure uh, program, which was begun in 2007, to obtain a true center of excellence, which really was a huge step forward. You had to have all of those accreditations, that is, mammography, stereo, breast ultrasound, and breast MRI, which was added in 2010. I must say I'm very proud of the fact we were among the very first to obtain our center of excellence certificate uh, back in 2007. Uh, really a dramatic step forward and that one that I was very proud to be part of. This has also spread to other areas within radiology. There are now uh, at least 10 different uh, accreditation programs, not only in breast imaging, but in other areas of radiology. Uh, so every single area is now being uh, brought forward through these uh, accred accreditation procedures and programs, all voluntary, but all essential to good quality. The next major contribution was one that was equally important, if not more so, and that is the development of BIRAS. So what is BIRAS? Anybody know? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Breast Imaging Requir Reporting and Data System. So it's an acronym of those words. Uh, that's what BIRAD stands for. It is truly a reporting and data system. Uh, it was developed in 1992. Again, we got great images, but the reports were terrible. They were all over the map. Some were five, six pages long. They didn't even have a conclusion. So you, the, the four, sur four surgeons and our, our clinical colleagues had no idea what to do. Uh, so there had to be something done, and ACR again rose to the occasion and developed the BIRADS. They have consistent terminology with a whole lexicon of words that should be used so everybody understands what the MMLAs were. It provided clarity and an assessment category. At the end, there would be a number of grades that would sum up the whole thing. So a clinician would just look at, oh, it's a BIRADS 1. They knew exactly what that meant without even having to read the rest of the report, which hopefully they did. And this provided much better communication all the way around and also allowed us to do, for the first time, really easy outcomes monitoring. So all of this was, came about because of BIRADS. In the fourth edition of BIRADS, not only mammography was covered, but also ultrasound and MRI. And that went even, and here you can see the uh, cover of the BIRADS atlas from that time, including all three modalities. In 2014, out came the fifth edition, which is the one that's currently in use. And this included not only updates in mammography, ultrasound, and MRI, but also follow-up and outcome monitoring was expanded dramatically and a data dictionary. Really quite a dramatic uh, improvement. And I must say, this has truly become the breast imaging Bible for the entire world. It's now been translated into at least eight languages. Yeah, I can tell you, I, everywhere I go throughout the world, this is the Bible. This is what people are using. It's so incredible to go, and I can say by reads three to somebody, and they'll know exactly what I'm talking about in any language. It's pretty neat. It's a, a wonderful step forward. The lexicon, as I mentioned, for descriptive terms and definitions made a huge difference, as did the standardized reporting language. Uh, and then again, there's the medical audit and outcomes monitor, which has been very helpful as well in determining whether or not you're doing the job for which you're supposed to be doing. Uh, the lexicon, here just to summarize this one uh, chart, you can see here is mammography and ultrasound. The words that were chosen tried to be as closely uh, utilized from one modality to the next. So if you're describing a mammogram or an ultrasound, it's kind of the same words. Um, MRI, a little bit of a different language because it's, we're seeing things differently with that, uh, uh, the, the vascular images I talked about. So um, a little different language, but the terms were being used across the word board by everybody. And this was the assessment category section, which uh, also has been adapted for uh, by MQSA. So you, every exam had one of seven different categories, from category zero up to category six. Not only was there a number assigned, but also a phrase, from negative to known uh, biopsy proven malignancy. So everybody knew exactly what you were talking about when you put that assessment category at the end of the report. All of this led to the uh, codification of this uh, legislation, so-called MQSA, the Mammography Quality Standards Act, which was passed in 1992. 
And this really changed everything. Why was this developed? Because even though the ACR was doing so much on a, uh, a voluntary basis to improve the quality of the images and the quality of the reporting, there were still a lot of outliers. Women were demanding more uniform quality. Uniform quality. There was a march on Washington to do this, and it did evolve into the MQSA. Uh, and then the FDA was assigned uh, to, uh, to oversee this. They basically took the mammography accreditation program and the bioreds and just kind of rolled them into one and created a federal law, which almost took, took it almost word for word. They basically codified the ACR and the mammography accreditation program for the interim rules. They still wanted to write their own rules, uh, which were the final rules, which came out in 1998, but they were still based on the accreditation program of, and bioreds of, of ACR almost exclusively. And I was part of that process. I was on the committee with uh, who. Uh, consulted with the FDA, but I must say ACR was a major player in that, and they have been, they still remain the major accrediting body. And this is how it works. Uh, the law, which was passed in 1992 by Congress, gave uh, FDA the power to be the regulators. They certify facilities. If you don't have a certificate, you can't practice in water in the United States. But to get the certificate, you have to be accredited. And who's the major accrediting body? About 90 plus percent of the facilities. American College of Radiology. So we still are very active in this process. There is also a state inspection in the state. Uh, so that has been huge. BIREDS has created a huge uh, advantage to us, and that was translated into the Memorial Quality Standards Act, which is still the only legislation that legislates any part of energy. Then there came along the ACRIM trial. Now, ACRIM stands for, as you probably know, the uh, American College of Radiology investigated uh, network, and it was developed, it began in 1998 when the ACR received a grant from the National Cancer Institute to develop a series of trials to be conducted uh, to lengthen and improve the quality of cancer patients' lives. And this was right up our alley, of course, with breast cancer, and in 19, uh, 2000, slightly thereafter, the first big screening trial was begun under Akron with digital mammography imaging screening trial, the so-called DEMIS, uh, which showed the medical world the added value of digital mammography. Because until that time, it was out there, but people weren't using it. They weren't sure it was any better. It was expensive to change over. It was hard to do initially. Uh, so they, they, the people were very resistant. So the only way to convince not only radiologists, but the payers that there was an advantage to digital mammography was to conduct a huge study, and that was the DEMIS trial. 50,000 women. 2003, studying five different digital units or systems in 35 sites throughout the United States and Canada. They evaluated the diagnostic accuracy of film screen and full field digital mammography. All patients underwent both exams. They had a digital exam and a film screen exam. And two radiologists read them independently. They wouldn't know what the other radiologist was saying. And then any, any abnormality was evaluated no matter which exam they was found on. Results were published in 2005 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they were pretty impressive, especially in women with dense breasts. What they found was that this is what they call an ROC curve, or receiver operating curve. The higher the curve goes, the more accurate the test is. And here you can see that the digital exams uh, function at this level up here, and the film screen exams down here. So a clear difference in the quality of the accuracy of the exam 15% more accurate uh, with digital than with film. So no question, digital is better for, uh, for finding cancer in women with dense breasts. It's even more impressive if the women is young, or are young. And here's an, uh, under 50, here's the, the ROC curve for digital, here's the RC, ROC curve for film. 44% more accurate with digital than with film in younger women with dense breasts. It really made the case dramatically for the evaluation uh, uh, and the use of digital mammography, and it went forward uh, and became a huge uh, product. And now, of course, there's basically, basically no film screen being done in the United States at all. It's all digital. Well, that was one step. What about tomosynthesis? Well, there's a trial right now going on through the, uh, Akron called the TMIS trial, tomosynthesis mammography imaging screening trial, to show the value. We think tomosynthesis is making a huge difference. There's lots of papers out there. Almost all of them show an advantage finding more cancers, and having to call less patients back to find those cancers. I said, there's no free lunch. You have to call more patients back to find more cancers. Well, not so with digital, or with tomosynthesis. It makes a huge difference. 
but this trial was needed to prove it. 165,000 women are being enrolled by 2020 in multiple sites in the United States and Canada. Patients are being randomized to either getting the TOMO exam or the non-TOMO two, for five years, with the imaging done either every year or every two years, depending on what facility it is, uh, with the idea being to see if TOMO synthesis really does have greater sensitivity and specificity than 2D. I'm pretty sure it does, but we need solid evidence. All of what we do in radiology is we try to be data-driven to show whether the results really are there. We eagerly await the results. We should know uh, shortly after 2020 if this really is going to be as dramatic as we think it is. I really think it's good. So the last part of my talk, I want to talk about the educational program and materials that are available through the ACR. And again, ACR has been instrumental in creating these programs to continue to educate all of these members, especially within breast cancer. For 50 years, the ACR sponsored the National Conference on Breast Cancer. And this was uh, done jointly with the Society of Breast Imaging over the last few years, uh, and uh, it has been a huge success. The ACR annual meeting, of course, also held every year here in Washington. Uh, again, breast imaging course is always a part of that. Uh, as you can see, there's a meeting coming up in May and, and again the following year here in Washington with the annual meeting. But the, the real crown and, and jewel are, is the Education Center, which was created across the way, which provides these amazing courses. Uh, we have the Breast Imaging Boot Camp being a, a big part of that, as well as Breast MRI. These are the two most popular courses, actually, at the Education Center. And we've even taken some of those courses, the Breast Imaging Boot Camp, to Australia and, and Saudi Arabia now. Uh, but this was a huge uh, accomplishment, I must say, on the part of the ACR to do this uh, kind of education. Back in 2010, uh, Gillian Newstead, uh, myself, uh, Rob, uh, Bob Smith, and Chris Comstock organized the first uh, breast imaging boot camp. We've now had 40, over 40 courses. Uh, as, uh, as Jenny mentioned, 2,000, more than 2,000 radiologists have gone through this program. And this is not just Hi, goodbye. This is three very intense days in front of a uh, your own workstation. Each attendee gets their own workstation. There are over 700 cases they can look at, over 300 cancers that they're able to see in that period of time. So they really learn what breast cancer looks like. They have to make the decisions themselves. It's all active learning, which is so much more effective than passive learning. There is a 10 to 1 ratio of attendees to faculty. We have a wonderful faculty who are available 100% of the time for anybody who has any question there. It's a fantastic opportunity to pick the brain of very good people, uh, to teach them the things that they don't learn from the cases themselves. A uh, really beautiful uh, program that was developed by Vinay Sand here uh, to, to create this incredible learning environment. Here's Vinay. <laughs> uh, surrounded by a few of us uh, sergeants there at the boot camp, uh, at, uh, uh, Gillian and Bob and Chris and myself. We really had a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to be involved in this project, and I really thank Vinay for his incredible ability to lead, lead us into this uh, fantastic project. And here's the very last uh, boot camp we had in September. Uh, some of, you may recognize some of these faces. Uh, Dr. Thor was always very supportive, always coming over to encourage us and uh, keep us uh, on, on our toes. And of course, Vinay always there to, to crack the whip and keep us going. <laughs> and wonderful faculty members from all over, from MD Anderson and uh, Sloan Kettering and University of Chicago, we've got great, great teachers there. We took the course to Saudi Arabia and Je Jeddah in May of 2016. Very successful, incredible uh, array of attendees, and they all just loved it. It's a fantastic experience. And most recently, we went to Australia, uh, three different courses there, but one of them for the first time was breast imaging. It was wildly successful. We had a full house, and everybody really, really loved the course. And I can't thank Vinay enough for, for taking this and making it truly an international kind of learning experience. Um, just briefly, I'll talk about the other issues that uh, ACR is involved, involved with every single day, and that is the website, the bulletin, the newsletters, which come out daily, weekly, monthly, available in print and electronic, as you know, the versions, fantastic. And there's always something, always keeping us informed on state-of-the-art on a daily basis. We're talking about the task force on mammography in this particular issue. This is the most current issue. We're talking about the truth behind about screening, which is critical for us to get the word out to our uh, patients, uh, always helping us in every single way. We talk about the breast density laws, which are now a big issue throughout many states. They even have occasional, uh, and they also actually have uh, information for 
non-radiologists uh, where to find an accredited facility, uh, breast imaging, so women can be uh, alert to where to go to find the best imaging. And once in a while, they even have a kind of a, uh, a little uh, story about some of the, uh, the attendees or some of the uh, radiologists. And this is a story that Jenny did a, a few years ago, uh, talking about how I got interested in breast imaging. I was quite a story. My aunt uh, was a, a Auschwitz a survivor. Uh, and then at the age of 50, developed breast cancer and died because the surgeon did not get a mammogram. Really tragic, and it drove me more than anything else to want to make sure that never happened to another woman again. The reason I do what I do, breast imaging. Quite a story, and it's so nice. And it's really been an honor and a privilege to work with all of you, uh, and uh, it's just been great to, to, to work with uh, wonderful people at the ACR. The moral of the story, you are saving lives, each one of you, every single day. And who are the real winners here? You know who they are. The thousands and thousands of women we are finding early breast cancer. We are curing this disease, changing it to change the natural history of this entire disease. First time in history anything like this has ever happened. It's really a dramatic story. The future is so bright and interesting, and it's really a privilege and a pleasure to be part of it. One person can make a difference. Each of you as a person. We all are making a difference. Back in 1895, this guy made a lot of difference. You know who that is? <laughs> Wilhelm Lorenz, and he connects a picture over here of the uh, lobby. But it was really fascinating. Steve Fry brought this to my attention. They found some papers in his uh, desk when they reviewed all of his uh, stuff back in 1995 when they, for the centenary of the uh, uh, discovery of x rays. And this was phenomenal. He had such insight. This is what he said. I'm probably having trouble with the German, so I'll translate it for you. I believe that one of the greatest benefits for my exes would be for screening mammography, particularly for women aged 40 to 40. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> what crappy. Can you imagine? Anyway, I'm to say, I'm use the German again, this benefit may not be appreciated initially by those with a limited understanding of medicine, but eventually it will be appreciated by all. Let us hope that that is indeed the case. So I want to end on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a good note, so I'm making a musical note. Uh, I always like doing uh, some musical uh, parodies. And this one, everybody know the song Oklahoma from the musical? Well, okay, you've all got to help me sing this. It's all about what you do and what I do every day. It goes like this. Carson Owens, the mindless murderer we hunt as we scan each case. The foe we face makes the mammogram our battle front. Carson Owens sits up in many ways, stuck the lobular, the medo form. We mammographers were in a day, but now we have to fork them so much better through our ADR. So when we say, we'll find each one today, we know we're saying, you helped us find carcinoma, carcinoma, CA. <laughs>